Unit eight, setting the stage for the Cold War and decolonization. First thing is the big three at the end of World War II. You have Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, and Joseph Stalin. And these three countries have three conferences towards the end of World War II. The first one being the Tehran Conference, that is those three. And then um, at that conference, they uh, plan for the D-Day invasion to open up a second front in Western Europe to relieve the pressure from uh, the Soviets in Eastern Europe who were fighting the Germans. Then the Yalta Conference took place after D-Day, uh, but before the Germans had surrendered. So this is when you have uh, both the Americans and British closing in on the Germans from one side and the Russians closing in on the Germans from the other side. And the Yalta Conference is when those same three people discussed plans for post-war Europe. And then the final conference was the Potsdam Conference. This one was different because now FDR is dead, so he's been replaced by Harry Truman. Also, Winston Churchill has just been voted out of office. He's no longer prime minister of the UK. He's been replaced with Clement Attlee, uh, but Joseph Stalin is still there. So the Potsdam Conference is after the Germans surrendered, but before the Japanese surrendered. Shifting balance of power in uh, Europe, of course, you now have just two superpowers in the world after World War II. You have the US and the USSR. And uh, just like the Second World War uh, ended with the dropping of the atomic bomb, by the time you get to the early 1950s, you know, five or six years after that, you have the first hydrogen bomb, which is much more powerful than the original atomic bombs, which were uranium and plutonium bombs. This led uh, Dwight Eisenhower to uh, ramp up the arms race because we wanted more nuclear arms than the Soviets to protect ourselves. Dwight Eisenhower also warned against the military-industrial complex, which is the informal uh, alliance between a government and private defense companies, you know, companies that make weapons. And he said they should not have a close relationship because then defense contractors could maybe try to start a war because that would profit them. Self-determination is the idea that each country should choose its own form of government and leaders. That idea really spread after World War II, which is what led to decolonization, when European countries left their colonies and gave them independence. The United Nations formed after World War II. Uh, it replaced the League of Nations. This time, the US joined and played a leadership role. The Iron Curtain is the metaphor that described the split between Eastern and Western Europe. The reason why it was split is because you have free countries in the West and communist countries in the East. This is because at the end of, the, uh, of World War II, you have the Americans and British liberating the Western European countries from the Nazis, while you had the Soviets liberating the Eastern European countries from the Nazis. And each nation that liberated their part of Europe got to choose their future. America chose freedom for the West, and the Soviets chose communism for the East. Satellite countries, those were the states that were economically or politically dependent on larger, more powerful states. So for example, all of the Eastern European countries like Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, etc., they were satellite nations of the Soviet Union. Now, the Soviet Union, of course, is a communist country, and according to communist philosophy, they want to bring about a world revolution. This is a belief that organized workers would overthrow capitalism in all countries. Uh, thankfully, this has not happened. Containment was our new foreign policy starting in the mid-1940s after World War II. This was the idea of not letting communism spread any farther. The Truman Doctrine was a strong statement that the United States would do what it had to to stop the spread of communist influence. So this is to replace the Monroe Doctrine. No longer were we going to just stay in our hemisphere. We were going to actively prevent the spread of communism, or at least die trying. And uh, one way that we did that was through the Marshall Plan, which gave a lot of food and aid to Western European nations. This fought communism because we said if they are economically stable, they won't be desperate enough to turn to an extremist leader like Stalin. Now, Stalin did not allow Eastern European nations to get that money from us, and so he created his own aid program called ComCon, Council for Mutual Economic Assistance, and the scope of that was much more limited than the Marshall Plan. The space race started in 1957 with the launching of Sputnik, the first ever satellite. That was a Russian satellite. The US founded NASA, started investing in space exploration. Eventually, it ended with us uh, landing on the moon in 1969. Um, but that was a place where the Cold War was fought <clears throat> nonviolently. 
Mutual assured destruction. That was the idea that regardless of who started a nuclear war, both sides would be obliterated by the end of it. And mutual assured destruction basically prevented that a nuclear war would start. Okay, So the fact that we had such massive weapons prevented them from ever being used. The non-aligned movement, those were countries that did not want to be on either side of the Cold War. They didn't want to ally with the Americans or with the Soviets. They wanted to be completely neutral. Those were countries like India, Ghana, Egypt, Indonesia. A lot of formerly colonized countries, once they became independent, decided to be non-aligned. Effects of the Cold War. Proxy wars, such as the ones in Korea and Vietnam, resulted in millions of deaths. A proxy war is when two large powers fight a war in a third country and support different sides. So the two major powers don't necessarily face each other on the battlefield, but they support opposite sides, provide them weapons. Uh, Korea was one example of that. Vietnam was an example of that. Some lesser known examples would be Nicaragua with the Contra War and Algeria once the Portuguese left in 1975. We supported different sides, the Soviets and the Americans. The city of Berlin was split in half at the end of the Second World War and uh, East Germany was communist, West Germany was free, and it was e inside the Soviet sphere of, West, uh, of East Germany, which was uh, communist. Remember, West Germany was, uh, was free. Joseph Stalin wanted to make all of that region communist, so he put a blockade around free uh, West Berlin and uh, wanted to starve them out and then take them over and make it a part of communist East Germany. Truman wouldn't let that happen because of containment. Uh, we would defend West Berlin, and so he responded with the Berlin Airlift, in which he sent planes over there every day, dropped crates of food, and saved them during the siege. Eventually, Stalin broke the blockade. But then, uh, about 10, 13 years later, the next uh, Soviet leader, Nikita Khrushchev, built the Berlin Wall. He built the Berlin Wall around West Germany in order to prevent East Germans from escaping over the border into West Germany to be free. NATO. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization was a military alliance between countries of uh, Europe and North America in order to protect against potential communist invasion. Now, the communists felt threatened by the emergence of NATO, and so they created their own, uh, their own uh, military alliance with the entire communist bloc or, or, or um, group of communist nations in, in Eastern Europe, and that was known as the Warsaw Pact. The Warsaw Pact no longer exists. NATO still does. There's also the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, or CETO, same kind of thing, military alliance, and then the Central Treaty Organization, or CENTO, in um, the Middle East. So the Korean War, that started when Stalin um, uh, encouraged Kim Il-sung, the new communist leader of North Korea, to invade South Korea. Well, that's not communism being contained, right? So Truman went to the UN, asked for permission for a police action, and then he sent Douglas MacArthur and UN troops to Korea to push the Koreans back over the 38th parallel, where it had been split uh, in half after World War II. A stalemate ensued, and this war continued for three years. Eventually, Eisenhower was able to negotiate a ceasefire, and the war ended in 1953, with neither side completely winning or losing, but Korea being split between communism in the North and freedom in the South. That's how it still is today. A uh, similar pro proxy war was in uh, Vietnam. Similarly, the North was communist and the South was free. Lyndon Johnson sent a lot of U.S. troops to South Vietnam to fight against uh, Ho Chi Minh's forces, the Viet Cong. And the reason why we were doing this was because of the domino theory, the idea that um, the idea that if one country falls to communism, then all other countries in the re region will fall to communism too. So we weren't just trying to keep South Vietnam free, we were trying to keep that whole region from falling to communism. In 1959, Cuba fell to communism under the leadership of Fidel Castro, and that was particularly concerning for the U.S. because it's so close to our border. So when Kennedy became president in 1961, he authorized the Bay of Pigs invasion, which was an invasion of Cuba that tried to assassinate Castro and overthrow his communist regime. That did not work, and it led to the Cuban Missile Crisis the very next year, in which Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev sent Soviet missiles to Cuba for their own protection, but also to, um, to threaten the U.S., uh, this was uh, a very tense moment. We came very close to nuclear war. Eventually, a, um, a truce was agreed upon where America agreed not to invade Cuba anymore in exchange for the Russians removing their missiles. We also made a secret agreement to remove our missiles from Turkey, which was close to the uh, Soviet Union, but we wouldn't do that for six months. That was part of the deal.
Now, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, after we had just come so close to nuclear war, we tried to learn our lesson and try to prevent something like that from happening again. So we established a hotline, which is a direct telegraph, teleprinter link between the U.S. and Soviet leaders' offices so we could communicate more quickly should another crisis arise in the future. We also signed the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which outlawed testing nuclear weapons above ground, underwater, and in space. And we also signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which called on nuclear powers to stop spreading their nuclear technology to other non-nuclear countries. In response to all this, there was an anti-nuclear weapons movement in the 1960s and 70s in which a lot of people said we should give up all of our nukes in order to create peace. But then others said, well, the only reason we have peace is because we have nukes, and that way no one will bomb us. 8.4, the spread of communism after 1900. One thing that, um, that was a big priority for poor countries was land reform. And at its, at its most basic definition, this basically means uh, getting more people to own land, getting uh, land into more people's hands, especially the poor, which you know is, is a good motive. Um, but a lot of nations did it all wrong by seizing all private property and running, uh, running farms themselves you know, as the government and withholding food from those they didn't like. It was just a mess. The only two countries that were successful at land reform, at least in this chapter, were Ethiopia and Iran. And those were successful because they did not use socialism to do it. Okay? All of the nations that tried socialism or communism to successfully do land reform were unsuccessful. Starting with China, when Mao Zedong took over China in 1949, making it a communist state, he um, implemented uh, shortly thereafter the Great Leap Forward, his land reform plan where he collectivized all agriculture, it means he seized all private farms, and organized them into communes where individuals would live and they were run by the government. Government ran these very, very poorly. It caused failing harvests, uh, severe food shortages, and even despite this famine, uh, the Chinese government continued to export grain to other countries in exchange for money and weapons for them. So it's clear that Mao did not care about the well-being of his people, and because of that, over 20 million uh, Chinese peasants died of starvation, making Mao Zedong the uh, greatest killer in all of history. This was uh, eventually abandoned because it was just destroying the country, and people became very critical of communism in China. So in 1966, Mao attempted what he called the Cultural Revolution, where he tried to silence all of his critics by sending out his Red Guards, his, his special police force, to arrest uh, any dissenters and send them off to re-education camps, they called them, which are like concentration camps, labor camps, similar to the Soviet gulags, to punish anyone who um, disagreed with, with communism. In Iran, it was a little bit different. So in Iran, they still had the Shah from back in the days of the, the, per, the um, Safavid Empire, that they still have the Shah system. And the Shah of Iran in the early 1950s was named Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. Now, the U.S. supported him because he kept the region stable, he was pro-Western, and he was uh, very favorable to the U.S. and trading oil with us, which we desperately needed. Well, in 1951, uh, a new uh, a new leader came to power in Iran named Mohammad Mosaddegh, and uh, the U.S. did not like him as much because he nationalized the oil industry, stopped selling it to us, and we feared that he would create instability in the region. So the U.S. organized a coup d'etat, a takeover, in which we placed the Shah, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, back in power. Uh, now, the White Revolution is something that Shah Pahlavi uh, brought about in the 1960s especially, and this was a very successful land reform program in which he, um, he uh, undercut the power of traditional landowners uh, and increased uh, land ownership among peasants. It was called the White Revolution because it came without bloodshed. He gave women the right to vote. He organized a social welfare system and funded literacy programs. But des uh, despite his uh, economic progress for Iran, um, most of the Iranians still very much disliked him because he was uh, kind of controlled by America. He didn't put Iran first, he put America first, and even though his leadership was good for the majority of people of Iran, they still didn't like him because they wanted their own guy, not, not the guy that we put in power. Uh, so the Iranian Revolution was in 1979. This is when the Ayatollah Khomeini ousted the Shah from power and created an Islamic state, a theocracy in which the religious leader is also the political leader. Since then, Iran has been a major enemy of the free world. Land reform was tried in Venezuela uh, in the early 2000s with Hugo Chavez, who was a socialist, didn't work. Tried again in Guatemala, didn't work. Uh, tried in Vietnam, which was you know communist since we lost the Vietnam War. 
and uh, didn't work there. Now, it did work in Ethiopia. The person who was in charge of Ethiopia after World War II was named Haile Selassie. He had very good economic policies. He created a boom in the economy through the coffee trade. But like Shah Mohammed Reza Pahlavi of Iran, he was very supportive of America. And people in Ethiopia saw him as a pawn or a puppet of the West who put them first and not the Ethiopians. So there was another coup d'etat. There was a takeover in which he was ousted from power. 60 of his officials were assassinated. And a socialist named Mengistu Haile Mariam took over. He allied with the Soviet Union. He collectivized agriculture, which led to a massive famine, massive poverty, eventually rebellion, which uh, made him flee the country uh, in the 1990s. 8.5, decolonization after 1900. So decolonization is the process of uh, usually European but imperial countries leaving their former colonies, giving them independence. And this happened in the 30 years after World War II. So from 1945 until 1975, that's when uh, all of Africa became independent. That's when you know South Asia and Southeast Asia became independent as well. And uh, some very cl clear trends there are that whether independence was achieved through diplomacy or war, it usually resulted in one of two things, either a power vacuum and a power struggle or a civil war which created a lot of violence and conflict in that country that's now independent, or a corrupt kind of strongman government takes over and oppresses the civilians. Okay, so we're, we're going to talk about several of those. Uh, first off, the Muslim League that was founded in 1906. It advocated for a separate nation for Indian Muslims. Eventually that was created with uh, Pakistan, which you see on the next page, we're on page 580. Um, with the partition of India once it became independent. Going to Ghana in Africa, that was uh, a colony of the British. The British chose to leave in the 1950s. It was done diplomatically, and the new leader was Kwame Nkrumah. But Kwame Nkrumah became very corrupt, became very powerful, essentially became a dictator by the early 1960s, and started a one-party state, which means you can't have other political parties. He was a big supporter of Pan-Africanism, which is why he founded the Organization of African Unity, but in the end he uh, was not able to serve Ghana very well because he didn't put the people first, he put himself first. Algeria uh, gained independence violently. They had a series of wars. There was the Algerian War for Independence in the 1950s and 60s. Eventually, France gave them independence after fighting with them for a number of years. The French president to do this was Charles de Gaulle. So in 1962, Algeria became independent, but then immediately they, get, they went to fighting. And one group called the FLN, or the National Liberation Front, they seized power, they wreaked havoc on the entire nation, sent out lynch mobs and killed hundreds of thousands of people, and then set up a single party socialist state and oppressed the people of Algeria for a very long time. And then in the 1990s, there was an Algerian civil war in which uh, the FLN was ousted from power and things got a lot better in Algeria. Uh, next, Egypt. Uh, when Egypt became independent, Gamal Abdel Nasser took over, and he uh, touched off a national, uh, an international crisis when he took over the Suez Canal, which for a long time had been run by the British and the French. When he took it over, the British, French, and Israelis tried to fight back, but then the U.S. and the Soviet Union stepped in and said, we have to put an end to this war. This is going to lead to bad things. And uh, the compromise was that Egypt could control the canal as long as they let other nations use it. Okay, so that was seen as kind of a win-win for everybody, but kind of an embarrassment for um, Britain, France, and Israel because, you know, we stepped into their proxy war and said you can't do that, but then we fought our own proxy wars. In Nigeria, Nigeria became independent of the British in 1960. Um, but the majority um, tribe, okay, the tribe that uh, had more people was called the House of Fulani, and they were Muslim. And the minority tribe in Nigeria were the Igbos, and they were Christians. Well, the majority Muslim tribe persecuted the minority Christian tribe, and so the Igbos wanted independence. They wanted to secede from the rest of Nigeria and create their own state of Biafra so that they could you know, not be persecuted by their government anymore. And this was the Biafran Civil War. The Igbos lost because they were fewer in number, and Nigeria remain, remained one country. And still to this day, Christians are persecuted very, heav very heavily in uh, Nigeria. The Quiet Revolution is something that took place in the 1960s in Quebec, Canada. Quebec is different from the other provinces because it primarily speaks French and has French uh, ancestry and culture. And so they wanted to become independent from Canada, uh, but that did not happen. 8.6, newly independent states. The Zionist movement, which started during the Enlightenment, 
uh, was about trying to find a homeland for Jewish people in uh, Palestine, in their ancestral homeland, and that eventually was succeeded with the birth of the nation of Israel in 1948. And the first people who were allowed to move to Israel were um, survivors of the Holocaust who wished to move away from Europe for understandable reasons and go to their ancestral homeland. Immediately, all the nations around Israel did not uh, like this. They fought back against it. Um, the Arab nations did not believe that Israel had a right to exist because it was a Jewish state in a Muslim area of the world. So immediately, Israel's neighbors invaded it in 1948, and Israel repelled them. Uh, of course, Israel had conflict with Egypt during the Suez Crisis in 1956. Then there was a Six-Day War in 1967 in which the Israelis uh, defeated uh, Jordan, Syria, and Egypt, all neighboring countries of theirs. And then in 1973, Israel was invaded by Egypt and Syria, and they were able to repel this attack and win thanks to American weapons sent by uh, Richard Nixon. And ever since then, we have been sending uh, Israel weapons to defend themselves against their neighbors, some of whom still don't believe they had a right to exist. But one step of progress during the 1970s was the Camp David Accords, negotiated by Jimmy Carter in 1978. This is when the leader of I Israel and Egypt came to a peace agreement, and Egypt um, recognized Israel's right to exist. And they, this was the first Arab nation to do that. Um, but still, you do have other neighbors of Israel, such as Palestine, uh, with the Palestinian Liberation Organization, or PLO, uh, and its longtime leader, Yasser Arafat. Um, they still fight against Israel, try to take over their land and wipe them off the map. Uh, two groups who own land in that region are Fatah and Hamas, and they're constantly you know, fighting with, um, with Israel and trying to get uh, the Jews to leave Palestine. After the South Vietnamese fell to communism, the domino theory was proven correct because two of its neighboring nations, Laos and Cambodia, also fell to communism. It was particularly bad in Cambodia when they fell to communism under the Khmer Rouge. That was a, a communist guerrilla organization uh, led by Pol Pot, and they carried out a genocide against about one-third of the Cambodian population. Over two million people were slaughtered in what became known as the killing fields. When India and Pakistan separated, immediately you start to see land disputes because some territories on the border of Pakistan and India, both nations claim. And one part of, of, uh, of those land disputes is Kashmir, that's a part in uh, northern India and Pakistan and part of China, and all three of those nations claim it's there. So land dispute is still a big issue in South Asia today. Uh, but for, uh, for, uh, for women's history, um, South Asia was the first place where women were voted into political office and led countries. Uh, for example, you have Sirimavo Bandaraneki. She was the world's first female prime minister, and she was over Sri Lanka. In India, in 1966, they elected Indira Gandhi, and she was their first female prime minister. She led the country for 15 years. And Pakistan became the first Muslim-majority nation to elect a female prime minister. Her name was Benazir Bhutto. Tanzania was uh, decolonized in 1961, uh, the British left, but then uh, its first president, Julius Nyerere, instituted a socialist economic regime, which led to extreme poverty, which is still a big issue in Tanzania today. Last term for this chapter is a metropole. A metropole is a large city of a former colonial ruler where people from former colonies currently move to voluntarily. So for example, London, in England as a metropole, you have a lot of people from India or Africa moving there voluntarily now, even though London used to control their nations um, without their consent. 8.7, global resistance to established power structures. First, we have peaceful movements. You have the one organized by Mohandas Gandhi in India, which was successful in getting the British to leave in 1947. You have the civil rights movement here in America, led by Martin Luther King Jr. This was successful in ending the uh, Jim Crow and segregation era of our history. And Nelson Mandela was successful uh, at ending apartheid, which was their system of racial discrimination and segregation in South Africa, and all of them did so peacefully. Now in Eastern Europe, all of the nations had a communist leader who was, um, who was like reported to the Soviet Union, who was kind of controlled by the Soviet leader of the time. In Poland, that person was Vladislav Gamulka. In Hungary, that person was Emre Nagy. But then, in 1956, he tried to separate from the Soviet Union and not be controlled by them anymore. He told the Soviet troops to go home. But then, the Soviets invaded Hungary and subdued them into submission and killed Emre Nagy. 
Similar thing happened in Czechoslovakia 12 years later in 1968. This was called the Prague Spring, and it was led by Alexander Dubček, who tried to give his people more freedoms, uh, which they didn't have under communism. And the new leader of the Soviet Union, Leonid Brezhnev, responded with the Brezhnev Doctrine. This was an idea he formed that stated that the Soviet Union and its allies would intervene if an action by any country threatened socialism in that country. And Alexander Dubček was trying to get rid of socialism in that country, so the Soviets responded by invading Czechoslovakia and not letting that happen. The United States had a lot of turmoil in the late 60s and early 70s. One example was a shooting that took place at Kent State University in Ohio, in which Ohio National Guardsmen killed four unarmed students who were demonstrating against the Vietnam War. Now, there were uh, three examples of groups in, in different nations that tried to bring about change in their country violently, and all three of them failed to do so. Okay, so peace works much better than violence. The first example was in Northern Ireland. Uh, this was mostly a Catholic versus Protestant fight. Northern Ireland is a part of the UK, and the rest of Ireland is its own country. Um, there was a Catholic group called the Irish Republican Army, or the IRA. They wanted to bring Northern Ireland back into the rest of Ireland, which is mostly Catholic, but Northern Ireland wanted to stay in the UK because they were mostly Protestant, just like the UK is. <clears throat> and the Protestants fought with the Ulster Defense Association. This fighting, uh, called the Troubles in Ireland, lasted from 1969 to 1994. That's 25 years. In total, 3,500 people were killed. In Spain, a region of northern Spain called the Basque region wanted to become independent, and the Basque Homeland and Freedom Organization, also known as the ETA, uh, they killed 800 people, injured many others trying to get independence, and it did not work. They're still a part of Spain today. Uh, Peru. In Peru, a guy named Abimael Guzman built a revolutionary uh, organization called the Shining Path based on the ideas of Mao Zedong and the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. And uh, they tried to bring about communism in Peru. In doing so, killed 37,000 people and did not succeed in doing so. So violence is much less successful than peace in addition with being morally wrong. Okay, that's it for that chapter. And then we get to the last chapter in, cha in uh, Unit 8, the end of the Cold War, 8.8. .8. So Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev are the two people who deserve the most credit for ending the Cold War and bringing about a peaceful end of uh, the age of communism in Europe. Uh, but before we get to them, we got to talk about two other leaders, Richard Nixon and Leonid Brezhnev, who were about 10 years before uh, Reagan and Gorbachev. So the uh, policy that Nixon pursued with the Soviet Union in the 1970s was detente, and that means a relaxation of strained relations between these two countries, which had been very tense ever since the Cuban Missile Crisis 10 years prior. And when Nixon went to uh, the Soviet Union in May of 1972, he and Leonid Brezhnev signed the SALT Agreement. SALT stands for the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty. Um, this was designed to decrease our number of nuclear weapons and decrease the Soviets' number of nuclear weapons. Well, 10 years later, here comes Reagan and here comes Gorbachev. And Gorbachev is much different from his predecessors. He is not a violent person. He doesn't want uh, chaos. He doesn't want um, you know, slavery for his people. He wants them to be more free. And because of that, he brings about several reforms in the Soviet Union. For example, perestroika, which gave the Russians more economic freedom, and glasnost, which gave them more of an openness to society and more social uh, rights and freedoms. And because he was so reasonable, um, Reagan was able to work with him in bringing about an end to the Cold War. Now, Reagan's strategy for bringing about an end to the Cold War and winning the Cold War was called SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative. And this was an idea that we would create a system of satellites and laser beams that would uh, shoot down any potential nuclear missiles coming at us from Russia, specifically. And this scared the Russians because if, in theory, we could, if we could um, shoot down their missiles, then it would be like they didn't have any. And then we, in theory, could bomb them with no repercussions at all. So this caused Gorbachev to come to the peace table and negotiate for peace with Reagan. This led to the signing of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, which restricted the number of nuclear weapons each country could have. And ever since then, the number of nuclear weapons each nation has has decreased steadily, uh, even still to this day. Um, Gorbachev, uh, allowed the Berlin Wall to be torn down in 1989. Uh, then every Eastern European nation um, 
ousted its communist leader and became free. Finally, in 1991, Gorbachev resigned as the general secretary of the Soviet Union and said there would be another, would not be another. Uh, and this, this ended the Cold War uh, because it collapsed the Soviet Union and uh, he earned a Nobel Peace Prize for it. Very deserving uh, recipient, to be sure. All right, and then we get to unit nine, the final unit of the year. We just went over it, so we can go over this super quick, uh, just each bolded term here. Uh, 9.1, advances in technology and exchange. Uh, radio was one of the first revolutionary uh, technologies of the early 1900s. Shipping containers was another big one. Uh, large uh, standard sized units that could be carried on a truck or train or stacked on a ship. Uh, this promoted the widespread movement of people and goods. So throughout the 20th century, you have an increase in communication technology and transportation technology, which led to globalization, which is what this unit is called. The Green Revolution uh, emerged as a possible long-term response to hunger. So throughout the 20th century, the world population went up, 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 um, way up, exponentially. Uh, went from about 1 billion to nowadays close to 8 billion. Uh, people, maybe even over 8 billion today. And the first you know, concern when you hear that is, do we have enough food to feed all those people? Well, the Green Revolution came about exactly when we needed it, and this dramatically increased the food supply around the world and permanently reduced hunger around the world. Uh, so even though there are way more people on Earth today, there are fewer hungry people on Earth today, which is a great thing. Uh, and the Green Revolution did this through genetic engineering and crossbreeding, which led to higher yields and more, uh, a greater food supply. Some medical innovations came about around this time. For example, in the 1920s, Scottish biologist Alexander Fleming made the first antibiotic, penicillin, which uh, fights infections and helps people uh, survive wounds. You also have reliable birth control, which allows um, women not to uh, get pregnant as much. And because of this, you have a drop in fertility rates around parts of the world where birth control is easily accessible. You also have the introduction of vaccines. And these have been used to decrease uh, the number of uh, people who die from certain deadly communicable diseases. And uh, with smallpox in particular, it completely eradicated that disease. Uh, pandemics are epidemic diseases that spread across national borders, and smallpox was a recurring pandemic throughout much of human history. Uh, it goes back all the way to ancient Egypt. There was the um, smallpox pandemic that wiped out so many of the Native Americans when the Europeans came here in the 1500s. Um, and so it's something that humans had, had been, um, been killed by for a very, very long time. Um, but then, starting in the 1960s, you have a, a global vaccination campaign to try to wipe out the disease. And by the 1980s, it had been completely wiped out. There's not been another case of smallpox in the world for over 40 years. That's a huge, huge um, victory for health and science. Malaria is a parasitic disease spread by uh, mosquitoes. It's a blood disease that can kill you. Uh, it killed more than 600,000 people each year in the 21st century, in the early 21st century, like 20 years ago. and. Um, and uh, this is a preventable disease. You know, if you don't get bitten by those mosquitoes who can then trans transfer, um, transfuse an infected blood to you, then you won't get it. So a group called Doctors Without Borders uh, has treated a lot of people with malaria and there are also preventative ways uh, to not get malaria like sleeping with a bed net over your bed. Tuberculosis or PD, uh, TB is an airborne infection that spreads through coughs and sneezes. It affects the lungs. Um, vaccination and treatments are both uh, available. Cholera is a bacterial disease that spreads through contaminated water. It it's, uh, causes about 95,000 deaths a year. And once again, you have um, vaccinations and uh, treatment available to some, but in the poorest places on earth, the kind of places with really contaminated water, that's usually where you don't have the kind of health care that you need. Okay, So in those poorer countries, those developing countries, that's where you have people dying still of malaria and tuberculosis and cholera, whereas you don't have that so much in countries like the U.S. We're very blessed in that way. Polio used to be uh, a very deadly disease that affected 100,000 new people every year. It caused paralysis. A lot of times you'd be paralyzed from the waist down. Uh, famously, Franklin Roosevelt had polio. Uh, but then in 1955, 
Jonas Salk, an American researcher, developed an injectable vaccine. And then a few years later, Albert Sabin uh, developed an oral vaccine. And um, these led to the almost complete eradication of polio around the world in all but just a couple of countries. It's been completely cured. Uh, emerging epidemics, HIV and AIDS. Uh, AIDS is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, and it's caused by human immunodeficiency virus. In total, it killed more than 25 million people around the world in the late 20th century, uh, most of them in Africa. It spreads through the exchange of bodily fluids. Uh, there is no vaccine for it. However, it can be uh, treated with antiretroviral drugs, uh, which can help you live for a very long time, even if you do have AIDS or HIV. Ebola is, is a deadly disease caused by, um, caused by interaction with the African fruit, uh, fruit bat, humans and other primates. And uh, there was a big outbreak of Ebola in uh, 2014 in West Africa, but thankfully it didn't become a pandemic, didn't spread too much, uh, was not a big deal in America, thankfully. Heart disease is a disease associated with longevity, meaning the longer you live, the more likely you are to get heart disease. Uh, it's also more common in uh, richer countries because um, we tend to eat, uh, eat poorly. We tend to choose uh, to eat poorly, and that's bad for our hearts, too. Uh, the first heart transplant was performed by South African Dr. Christian Barnard in 1967, and then Robert Jarvik led a team that de designed an, an artificial heart, uh, which can be used to keep you alive and keep your bl blood pumping during open heart surgery. Alzheimer's disease is also a disease that almost always affects, um, almost only affects the old, I should say, and uh, this is a form of dementia where people lose their memory, and uh, hopefully one day there will be a cure for this, but not yet. 9.3, technology and the environment. Uh, a lot of environmental issues have arisen in the past 150 years. However, uh, new technologies have also found ways to, uh, to help um, those same issues that, that uh, have been caused. So first off, deforestation, that's the lo loss of Earth's trees as a result of cutting down too many trees and not planting new ones. Desertification is the removal of the natural vegeta vegetation cover through expansion and intensive use of agricultural lands and arid and semi-arid lands. That's uh, just changing the ecosystem. Uh, you also have a decline in air quality due to pollution and water scarcity has become an issue, uh, not having enough clean water to drink. About a billion people on Earth suffer from water scarcity. About one in eight uh, people on Earth um, do not have clean water to drink, and that's a major, major problem. Uh, next, greenhouse gases. Uh, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are those that build up in the atmosphere and let the heat of the sun reach Earth, but trap it from escaping the Earth. Uh, this has led to global warming or an increase in the uh, world's overall temperature. Uh, the increase has been very slight, very gradual, but it is happening and, um, and should certainly be aware of okay, because we don't want it to, to get worse. Fossil fuels are coal, oil, petroleum, and natural gas. Uh, those are non-renewable resources, meaning once they're gone, they're gone. Uh, so we do have renewable energy sources, which are derived from resources that are continually replenished, like wind, solar, tidal, and geothermal uh, power. Throughout the world, there are several uh, green parties, which are political parties that specifically focus on environmental uh, needs. The Green Belt Movement was created by the, the greatest environmentalist of all, Wangari Maathai, a, a, a Kenyan woman who created this to, um, to build back the ecosystem of Kenya. It ended up planting 51 million trees and uh, employing 30,000 women in, um, in planting these trees and, and restoring the ecosystem. And she received a Nobel Peace Prize in 2004 for doing so, first African woman to receive a Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, the term carbon footprint is the amount of carbon diox dioxide that each person produces. The Kyoto Protocol in 1997 was the first major international agreement to try to reduce carbon emissions. A similar thing was signed in uh, 2015, the Paris Agreement uh, that tries to combat global warming. Uh, last term in this uh, uh, chapter is Anthropocene. This term means the new man, and it's a term that uh, scientists want to call this age of human history. 9.4, economics in the global age. Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher uh, both uh, believed in economic liberalization. That's the opening up of a country's economy, having very little government involvement, kind of similar to Adam Smith from, from the Enlightenment, uh, not having as much government involvement, having a free market where people pursue their own uh, economic interests and in turn allow others uh, to do the same. And economic liberalization became a big trend in the late 20th century and early 21st century. 
as a reaction against socialism and communism, which had failed over and over again and led to starvation and poverty worldwide. Uh, so with Reagan in America, uh, the economy became more free. With Thatcher in the UK, it became more free. Uh, with Gorbachev in Russia, it became more free. And then with Deng Xiaoping in China, also the economy uh, became more free. But unfortunately, in China, uh, Deng Xiaoping's um, economic freedoms were not accompanied with social freedoms. Like people still weren't given freedom of religion or freedom of speech or anything like that. And that's what led to the protest at Tiananmen Square in uh, 1989 in which Deng Xiaoping uh, sent in the tanks and, and slaughtered a thousand people, the Tiananmen Square Massacre, it's called. In Chile, someone who promoted economic liberalization, which got a lot of people out of poverty, was Augusto Pinochet. Uh, economic change, you have two different types of economies, largely in the world. You have manufacturing economies and knowledge economies. Manufacturing economies are focused on um, creating stuff and knowledge economies uh, create, distribute, and use knowledge and information. So things like uh, designers, engineers, teachers, other jobs that deal with information, not so much in making stuff. And today, the main manufacturing uh, economies are in Asia and Latin America, and the main uh, knowledge economies are in uh, North America and Europe. Um, some countries that became very wealthy around this time due to economic liberalization were the Asian tigers, that would be Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan. They, along with Japan and China, um, have lifted millions of people, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty um, by giving them more freedom in the economy. NAFTA is the North American Free Trade Agreement. This agreement encouraged U.S. and Canadian industries to build maquiladores, or factories in Mexico, that use low-wage Mexican labor to produce tariff-free goods for foreign export. Uh, that's a big trend um, over the past 30 to 40 years is reducing tariffs. A protective tariff is something that taxes foreign uh, imports, and those have been going down uh, in recent years, due mostly to three organizations, Mercosur in South America, the Association of South a Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, uh, and GATT, or the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. The World Trade Organization, or WTO, they uh, control about 90% of the world's trade. Multinational corporations are legally incorporated in one country, but makes and sells goods in multiple countries. So for example, Michael, uh, uh, Microsoft and Google in America, Mahindra and Mahindra in uh, India, and Nestle in Switzerland. Those are all multinational corporations. 9.5, calls for reform and responses. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights was uh, passed by the UN in 1948. Human rights are basic protections that are common to all people, not given by the government, but given by God, and therefore the government can't take them away. And one uh, group that the UN uh, created in order to protect human rights was UNICEF, the United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund, try to provide food and aid for children who are in need. The International Court of Justice is a judicial body set up by the original UN Charter, tries to negotiate uh, settle disputes uh, over international law. Another main aim of the UN is to pre protect refugees, or people who have fled their home countries in times of war, famine, and natural disasters. The Negritude Movement took place in West Africa. It emphasized pride in uh, blackness and not being ashamed of the color of your skin. Leopold Sadar Senghor was one of the advocates for the Negritude Movement, and he became the first leader of Senegal once it decolonized. Liberation theology blends the ideas of socialism and Catholicism. It's very common in Latin America, and one of the biggest proponents of liberation theology is Pope Francis, the current pope. The Civil Rights Act and Voting Rights Act in the 1960s in the U.S. Uh, did away with Jim Crow laws and segregation and outlawed discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. It completely transformed the country, the civil rights movement. In South Africa, their system of apartheid and forced segregation of people based on race, uh, so-called pass laws required black South Africans to carry identity documents when entering areas set aside for whites, which they often had to do when traveling uh, for their jobs. They couldn't vote, they couldn't have certain jobs, couldn't live in certain areas of the country, couldn't marry people of different skin colors. It was it was pretty, pretty repressive. And uh, one person who, um, who uh, was an activist against this was Desmond Tutu. He was an Anglican archbishop who traveled around the world and encouraged nations to stop trading with 
the racist South African government until they ended apartheid. Another person who protested against apartheid was Nelson Mandela, the leader of the African National Congress, or ANC. He was thrown in jail for uh, protesting against uh, apartheid, and he was in jail for over 25 years. Uh, eventually, South Africa became a pariah state, or an undesirable state. You know, by the 1970s and 80s, there were protests all around the world trying to get South Africa to change, and they you know, hung on to their system for a really long time. Uh, despite the fact that they were banned from the Olympics and they were uh, removed from the United Nations. Uh, eventually, the person who changed all that was South African President F.W. de Klerk, who became president in 1989, um, realized that a change was needed. You know, it was time to, to end apartheid, and so he released Nelson Mandela from prison, released other political prisoners as well, and uh, negotiated an end to apartheid. This, this led to the first um, free elections in South African history, where all colors could vote, and uh, that was in 1994, and Nelson Mandela was elected the first black president of South Africa. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission is what was used to bring about that progress in South Africa. In India, the caste system has existed for hundreds of years, and this has um, been a rigid social system where you can't move up the social ladder, you're just born into whatever caste or social class you're in. And at the bottom were the Dalits, uh, also known as the untouchables. Now, uh, in the 21st century, you start to have the caste reservation system. And through this system, the Indian government has reserved a certain number of good jobs and good places in uh, education for Dalits to try to give them uh, more ways to get out of uh, poverty while retaining their caste. Earth Day uh, is a day for people to focus on environmental awareness. It's April 22nd each year. Greenpeace was a multinational agency uh, that battles deforestation, desertification, global warming, the killing of whales, and overfishing. And then uh, we already talked about Wangari Maathai and the Greenbelt movements. All right, just a couple more uh, chapters. Modernism is a rejection of tradition in favor of experimentation and uncertainty. It's kind of the opposite of conservatism, which tries to preserve what's good about the past and, and uh, preserve tradition. Consumer culture is one in which people tend to focus more on what they buy and what they own more than on where they live or who, is, uh, who their uh, families are, what they do for a living, what they believe. Uh, let's see, political changes at the time. Uh, popular culture is the culture of everyday people rather than the educated uh, elite, okay? So popular music on the radio versus opera, okay? That would, the popular music on the radio would be called pop culture. Americanization uh, is the idea of American culture being dominant throughout the world, spreading all over um, the globe, American restaurants and movies and, and, and clothing and sports, you name it, uh, were all over the world. Uh, but a lot of people around the world consider American consumer culture to be a throwaway culture because they object to the waste and pollution. Uh, that was a part of our focus on newer, cheaper, and more disposable products. You see the emergence of global brands like I Apple, Nike, and Rolex. Online commerce has made shopping a global affair. Uh, you have um, Amazon in 17 countries. You have Alibaba, which is mostly in Asia. Bollywood is an Indian Hollywood. They make a ton of movies. Anime is a Japanese form of animation. Reggae is a, a Jamaican style of music. K-pop is a Korean style of music. And uh, internet-based streaming video sites like YouTube have made all of these uh, uh, trends from other countries become global sensations, uh, which shows we're a very globalized society, largely due to uh, social media. Uh, one person who uh, became famous through social media and did a lot of good was Malala Yousafzai. She was the youngest uh, woman to win a Nobel Peace Prize, and when she was just a teenager, she was shot by the Pakistani Taliban for trying to go to school. And since then, she's been a, an outspoken advocate for uh, the right to education for girls and, and women uh, throughout the world. The Olympic Games started in 1896. They still uh, come about every uh, two to four years. The World Cup soccer competition is one of the biggest events in the world every four years. Some new religious movements in the 21st century are the Hare Krishna movement, which is based on traditional Hindu scriptures. There are also New Age religions, uh, forms of Buddhism, shamanism, and Sufism, who have become kind of trendy and popular in the West. Uh, Falun Gong is a movement based on Buddhist and Taoist tradition that's gained popularity, as has the idea of just being nothing, you know, kind of a non-believer, not really believing, believing in anything, and kind of being empty inside. Uh, 
Uh, 9.7 is resistance to globalization. The International Monetary Fund, or IMF, and the World Trade Organization, WTO, are two targets of anti-globalists. Um, there are a lot of reasons why people resist globalization. Um, first off, they say that it's too based on maximizing profit uh, at the expense of individual workers and of the environment. Uh, one thing that uh, people dislike about globalization is the fact that it led to more child labor, especially in places like West Africa. It leads to poor working conditions in warehouses, like, in, like uh, Amazon's warehouses, where the, the workplace is not ideal. And one of the worst examples was the collapse of the Rana Plaza factory in Bangladesh, which killed over a thousand and wounded thousands more. Uh, Muhammad Yunus, a, ba a Bangladeshi who won uh, the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, called for uh, better safety standards in factories uh, because of this. Uh, however, you do have the positive trend of ecotourism. Now that we're in a more globalized world, we can visit countries to visit their um, natural environment, and countries like Costa Rica have a vested interest in keeping their environment clean because that's why people come and spend money there. They want to see the jungles and the beaches. Brexit was uh, a resistance to globalization. That's when, in 2016, the British population voted to leave the European Union. Uh, Theresa May attempted to broker a deal to make this possible. She failed to do that and resigned. Uh, Boris Johnson became the next prime minister and succeeded in uh, helping the British to leave the European Union. Measures that anti-globalists favor would be, of course, human rights, uh, which we already talked about. Fair trade, that's a system that ensures the person who provided the good or service receives a reasonable payment for it. Sustainable development, that means business ventures that allow people and companies to make a profit without preventing future generations from meeting their own needs. And then debt relief or debt restructuring so that countries that owe huge sums to the IMF do not have to risk economic breakdown. Uh, social media has exposed a lot of injustices around the world. For example, the Uyghur ethnicity, which is Chinese Muslims in Western China, uh, the Xinjiang province. They are currently in concentration camps and being used as slave labor in cotton fields. And uh, China denies that happens, but you know we have evidence through through mass media. Now the Chinese restrict what their own people can see on the internet. Uh, their social media platform is called Weibo, which you know the government can control and monitor and make sure people aren't seeing the truth that they don't want them to see. Another country that uses um, social media uh, for, for bad purposes is Saudi Arabia. They've used uh, Twitter and Facebook to harass and intimidate citizens. One person who spoke out against this was Manal Al-Sharif, a women's rights activist. And last chapter, 9.8 institutions in, uh, that are developing in a globalized world. This mostly has to do with the UN. So the General Assembly, uh, that's the UN body in which all members have representation. There's something like 195 countries in the United Nations, and each of them get one vote for any resolution that's trying to be passed. The Security Council is different. Only 15 nations get a vote, and uh, five of them are permanent members of the Security Council, the US, Russia, China, Britain, and France and the other 10 are on a rotating basis. Uh, the Secretariat, that's the UN's administrative arm. Uh, peacekeeping is a big part of the United Nations goal. Um, world peace is a beautiful thing, uh, and it's, it's something that the UN has been uh, attempting to increase around the world for a very long time. Uh, this is when they send envoys to different nations, troubled spots to try to prevent war from breaking out. They're only lightly armed and are told to only respond in, in defense if they're fired upon, not to go in and kill the bad guys. Uh, the UN tries to protect refugees. Uh, the World Food Program, WFP, provides food aid uh, to people who need it. UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, uh, focuses on developing literacy, extending free education, and protecting cultural and environmental sites by designating them World Heritage Sites. Human Rights Watch, or HRW, has monitored human rights abuses in over 100 countries. The World Bank tries to fight poverty by providing loans to countries who need it. And the IMF, or the International Monetary Fund, is designed to help a country's economy by promoting stable currency exchange rates. And there are also non-governmental organizations, apart from the UN, uh, like the International Peace Bureau, that also work for world peace. All right, that is your review for units eight and nine.